Hello, today is Friday, February 3rd, 2023. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. If you work in the ICT industry, you know the one constant is change, and that change seems to be in hyper mode the last few years. There are lots of reasons for that. Changing work behavior due to COVID-19, better, more reliable technology and services, things like UC and SD-WAN, and lower cost alternatives to legacy telecom. This is great for enterprise buyers of ICT, but not so great for the incumbent vendors because these changes, they cut into their profits. Now, if you're an investor or on the vendor side, don't worry because these suppliers have figured out how to get their pound of flesh. And that is by assessing more and more surcharges. Let's take a look at these surcharges and what they mean for enterprises. To do that, I'm joined by Laura McDonald, a senior partner at LB3, and one of the authors of What to Expect in 2023, which is a piece that we posted on LB3's and TC2's websites. And this happens to be one of those topics that we highlighted. And we are also joined by my fellow TC2 director, Teresa Knutson. Hey, Teresa and Laura, welcome back to Staying Connected. Hey, Joe. Thanks. It's great to be back. Joe, thanks for having us back. This is an important topic, and so I'm glad we get a chance to expand on what we wrote and to get Teresa's thought, because she's a real leader in this area. Well then, Teresa, let me start with you. To offset the lost revenue, it seems that vendors keep inventing new surcharges or increasing existing surcharges to supplement their diminishing service revenue. How is a company supposed to budget for these surcharges? I mean, they're not in the contract, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. These regulatory and other pseudo-regulatory fees are not in the contract. They're actually buried in the vendor service guides. So budgeting and forecasting for telecom spend has always been a challenge. Even for the most sophisticated companies who have a great handle on their inventories and their costs, they really struggle with how to correctly budget and forecast for the ever-changing landscape of regulatory and related fees imposed by vendors on services. The big fee, USF, is adjusted quarterly by the FCC. And this USF rate trickles down to other vendor-imposed pseudo-regulatory charges that the vendors have created. All right. So USF, that's a real surcharge imposed by the government on the suppliers, though technically the vendors don't have to pass it on. And well, we know that they do. So generally speaking, the clients that I work with, they do understand USF and where it applies. What they don't have a great handle on is how to deal with these quarterly changes in USF or UCC in AT&T speak. And as we pointed out on lots of past podcasts, these changes can be significant. So what is an enterprise supposed to do, Laura? Ah, uh, Joe, to get to that utopia of correct financial budgeting and forecasting, you really need to understand more about USF and other vendor assessed surcharges. So USF is set by USAC. It's a FCC created entity. It's applied to interstate and international telecom services and to a slightly lesser degree, VoIP and mobile services. And the FCC announces the change to USF. You're right, it's quarterly, but about a month before the end of the quarter. We're going to have a whole other podcast on USF, so we're not going to get too much into the weeds. But let's talk a little bit about some of the other surcharges that are out there. So how do they create them? Well, unfortunately, I am not privy to the backroom machinations of the vendors on this front. But from a customer's perspective, it's pretty simple. They add them to the service guide. And vendors have a lot of freedom to create and impose on their customers a wide range of fees. And they often impose them as surcharges described to give the impression that they are government imposed fees instead of building them into the baseline or unit or usage fees. And two quick examples that come to mind on this are the property tax allotment surcharge and the USF administrative fee surcharge. Yeah, Laura, the even more ironic fact is those two surcharges and other surcharges similar to that that you mentioned are indeed revenue streams for the vendors. And you ask, how do I know this? Because PTA, the USF admin fee, and other similar surcharges are actually incrementally charged USF on them. So let that sink in a little bit. The suppliers are charging you these pseudo-regulatory fees, and then they charge USF on them. So we know that they are a revenue stream for those suppliers. And I'm going to pick on AT&T for a moment. Their property tax allotment, or PTA for short, is about 6.3%. 
They also assess USF on PTA at another incremental 1.7%. So that makes it around 8%. And get this, not all PTA charges are the same by vendor. So for example, Verizon charges 5.5% and Lumen is about 5.55%. So their totals when you add in USF are around 7.3%. And I mean, don't even get me started on the US admin fee. I mean, this one's kind of funny. AT&T always charged it since the inception of USF. Then about 10 years ago, Verizon created their own USF admin fee, albeit a little bit lower than AT&T's fee. So Verizon's USF admin fee is 0.38%, AT&T is 1.71%, and Lumens is 1.5%. So I guess what I interpret from that is that Verizon is much more efficient than their competitors in administering USF. And if you're asking yourself, do the vendors actually charge USF on the USF admin fee? The answer is Absolutely. Of course they do. But wait a minute, Laura, how is that legal? So that sounds like a simple question, but the answer is actually pretty complex. And I know, I know I sound like a lawyer, but it's definitely lawful for carriers to pass the USF charges on to customers, which you point out, most of them do, but it's unlawful for them to mark up USF charges. And as for these other charges, some of which Teresa just mentioned, well, folks need to know that carriers, they absolutely have a regulatory cost, but the FCC gives them wide discretion on how they recoup those charges. So in general, the FCC allows carriers to impose other charges to cover their expenses as a light item. And this includes the right to impose the administrative charge that Teresa mentioned above, which is really just allowing them to recover the cost of complying with USF, which is billing you. So this complexity is mind-boggling. Both LB3 and TC2, we do spend a lot of time tracking these surcharges. And last time I looked, there were like seven or more line item charges, depending on your carrier of choice. Well, it does vary more than you would think, particularly as the carriers add regulatory sounding surcharges. In fairness, it's not brand new, but the number of fees, the number of carriers charging them, and the amounts have actually grown. So in 2005, a group representing customers citing confusion from the wide range of charges assessed by the carriers actually petitioned the FCC to prohibit the carriers from imposing any line item charges that hadn't been authorized or mandated by the government as surcharges on customers, noting that many of them did have names that gave the impression that they were mandated charges. Well, the FCC denied that petition, but they did remind the carriers that they have to comply with Sections 201 and 202 of the Communications Act, which is basically they have to act in a just and reasonable manner, and that they had to comply with the FCC's truth and billing requirements, which are relatively limited in scope and application. And they also warned them against stating that a charge is mandated when it wasn't. And that's why you'll see in some of the carriers, like Verizon's description of their charges, language that says these are not a tax or a fee that the government requires Verizon to collect. So if you go and look at their carrier annual regulatory charge, you'll see that charge and that description. Yeah. And as we saw in 2022, and frankly, as we expect to continue this year, the vendors will probably continue to raise these costs on enterprises and probably invent new surcharges to augment their revenue. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Joe. And another thing companies need to be aware of is that no two vendors assess these fees in the same manner or on the same types of products. Some are similar. They often have different names. But while the general guidance is given by the FCC as to which services the USF applies, there's a lot of room for interpretation, and we do see a wide interpretation by the vendors. The complexity is a bit by design because if you don't understand it, you can't question it. And believe me, I spent time yesterday recalculating these fees from some recent invoices, and it took a working knowledge of two variable algebra and the vendor service guides to actually work it out. Uh, that sounds like a fun afternoon, Teresa. <laughs> um, but if you look at it from the vendor's perspective, they have cost and they want to make money. So the advantage of having these surcharges set out and at the bottom of the bill, and as someone pointed out, once one vendor adds it, others usually follow, is one, they take them out of the fixed fees, which the enterprises are looking at pretty carefully and they compare, and the surcharges are generally adjustable, and guess which way they go? Usually up. So the vendors add provisions in their contract that allow them to impose surcharges and to change those surcharges. And it's frankly really hard to work around those clauses. What's the result? Increased fees. 10 years ago, AT&T's federal regulatory fee was about 2.4%. Now it's 7.92%. And new ones have appeared, such as the new Verizon's economic adjustment charge, which they sent out notices to customers about. 
Yeah, let's talk about Verizon's economic adjustment charge. So Verizon added this one last year to its wireless plans to cover a cost associated with the current economic conditions, i.e. Verizon wasn't making as much profit as they wanted to. So rather than raise the base fee on wireless plans, which you guys all know is a highly competitive and tracked rate and one that's especially noticeable in the consumer market and the consumers react quickly, it figured out they could increase their profits by adding another surcharge. I mean, it's actually brilliant for them and it's really bad for you. Now, we've highlighted a lot of fees and charges on this podcast and a few percent here, a few percent there. That doesn't sound like much, but enterprises need to know on certain domestic services that surcharge regulatory fee overhead, it exceeds 50% of the cost of services. And frankly, we expect that to increase in 2023. So understanding how these surcharges and regulatory fees impact a company's spend Well, it's critical to building a reliable budget for your telecom spend, and it's also an essential factor if you are taking your services out to bid. Now, you might think that your vendor account team has a handle on it. They don't. In our experience, account teams likely are not experts on the surcharges and the related fees. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're planning to do a competitive bid in 2023, it's critical that you have the suppliers provide not only their base costs, but also outline their USF and related surcharge and fees in their submissions and clearly state which services to these items apply. It can be applied to access. Is it access and ports? Is it, you know, not on DIA? Is it over here, over there? I mean, it's really complicated. So they need to clearly articulate to which services these fees relate to. So while the base costs are really critical to compare between the suppliers at first pass, really savvy enterprises need to look at the total cost of ownership, which includes USF and these related vendor assessed surcharges. And as a side note, when I'm doing procurements and doing TCO comparisons, I typically don't model state and federal taxes as those generally are applied on a consistent basis across suppliers. But USF and surcharges are absolutely not applied on a consistent and similar basis. And remember my tip about where you find these fees, you're not necessarily going to see them in your written contract. What you're going to see is a reference to the service guides, and they're going to be built into the service guides. Joe and I covered in a recent podcast the importance of service guides and understanding them and and actually reading them. And this is another example of that. That's where they sit for the most part. And suppliers usually, because of the way that these are named, will call these, you know, something regulatory cost recovery charge. So you might just assume that they're a mandated charge and they may not be. So you need to take that and factor in, as Teresa says, your decision making and how the carriers vary on this. So definitely look at those, look at them at least quarterly so that you can update your forecast and anticipate any significant movements and what you're going to be charged because of these fees. All right. Thank you, Laura. Thank you as well, Teresa. You know, it's crazy how the vendors can just add these fees and surcharges to their invoices. But knowing that they do can help you set a strategy on how to deal with the inevitable. This is pretty complex stuff. So if you need help understanding these costs, navigating the online guides, heck, even finding the online guides, we are here to help. So you can contact Teresa, Laura, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues by giving us a call or dropping us an email. You can also stay current by subscribing to Staying Connected, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.